Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We will now proceed with our first panel discussion on Ottoman Jerusalem. Welcome back to the first panel of the conference where our focus will be on Ottoman Jerusalem. I'm Sarkan Yolachan from the Middle East Institute. We have two uh, excellent papers. Uh, unfortunately, one of the uh, presenters couldn't make it uh, here, uh, but he'll be joining us. Uh, Roberto Mazza will be joining us uh, virtually. And uh, good morning. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, Roberto. I'll, and I'll start uh, with uh, in introducing him first. Uh, Roberto Mazza has two books, one on uh, Jerusalem from one titled Jerusalem from the Ottomans to the British, and another one called um, Jerusalem in World War One. One, the Palestine Diary of a European uh, Consul. He has published several articles and book chapters, details of which you can find in uh, his biography in the program. He has uh, two ongoing projects. One is on urban planning of uh, Jerusalem between 1917 and 1926, and another project discussing Italian uh, cultural diplomacy in Palestine from the late Ottoman era to 1948. Does this work? Uh, I think, uh, I presume the, the, the presentation comes uh, out of the uh, second uh, ongoing project. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Roberto. Uh, I hand it over to you, and you have uh, roughly 25 minutes or so. Okay, Teshikula, thank you very much. Uh, there should be a PowerPoint at some point, I guess, uh, that you can see. Uh, first of all, allow me to thank you for allowing me to present from uh, remotely from Italy, where I just want to remind you it's 4.30 in the morning, so I apologize for my red eyes. Um, what I'll do is essentially try to present briefly uh, the position of the consulates in Ottoman Jerusalem, because uh, I think it's very important to highlight the fact that, uh, you know, it's, it's something that developed through the 19th century, and of course it became paramount for all European and Western activities in the city. And later on I'll present briefly uh, the activities of the Italian consulates uh, up to 1948. So if you can upload the uh, uh, PowerPoint, just to show a few pictures here and there, okie dokie, I can see it on one of the screens. So the establishment of the consulate in Jerusalem uh, from the mid-19th century was a response to an increase in foreign uh, economic, social, and religious activities in the city and the surrounding areas. Now, the British uh, consulate was the first to be established in 1839, quite early, and then the German in 1842. Later, was of France, Piedmont and Sardinia, uh, which eventually became Italy later on in 1843, uh, the Austrian in 1849, and the Russians in 1858. Uh, just to mention that the Americans, uh, which is actually in, in the PowerPoint is the consulate on the left side um, of the screen, opened in 1844, uh, but only became uh, fully functioning in 1856. Uh, other smaller consulates opened in the early 20th century, and again, in the PowerPoint, you can see the other consulate, uh, it's the Swedish one, uh, which opened uh, at the very beginning of the 20th century. Now, what is important here is that the consuls derive their authority from the capitulations, so the agreements uh, between you know, the Ottoman Empire and the European countries, uh, which I should remind, in the very beginning, from the 16th century, favored the Ottomans or by the 19th century, were a burden on the Ottoman Empire. So the capitulations granted extraterritorial, uh, extraterritorial status uh, to all of the consuls, which meant freedom of movement, trade, and settlement uh, to the consuls, and more importantly, to their protégé, which is another interesting aspect uh, in the Ottoman legal system. Essentially, Ottoman subjects might have become uh, protégé, so they kept their own citizenship, or you know, they, they were still Ottoman subjects, but as protégé, they were essentially under the influence of foreign consuls, so fairly well protected. Now, consul, uh, consuls usually dealt with all aspects of uh, personal status of individuals under their protection. Uh, and furthermore, uh, consulates were the seats of consular courts, which dealt with all civil and criminal cases regarding foreign subjects. Consuls also presided over mixed courts, 
which adjudicated cases involving Ottoman and foreign subjects. And, and this is another, uh, you know, interesting aspects of how uh, the legal system changed as a result of a foreign, you know, presence. And Jerusalem is a very good case studies in this, uh, where essentially Ottoman uh, subjects, uh, you know, in case we're dealing with uh, non-Ottomans, might have been um, tried or subject to uh, foreign laws, uh, which tells us that the Ottoman Empire was obviously, uh, you know, experiences a lack of uh, legal sovereignty over their own territory. Um, now, by the outbreak of World War I, and this is another interesting aspect of uh, the, the, the Ottoman system, um, there were in Jerusalem six general consulates. Uh, and essentially, what this means is that uh, the consuls were directly responsible uh, to uh, the foreign ministries, uh, you know, sort of the, uh, the foreign office of their own countries, rather than to the ambassadors in Istanbul. Um, Again, this is an issue of uh, uh, you know making Jerusalem obviously a very important place. Normally, uh, uh, general consulates were only open in those uh, cities that were not capital cities, but they were considered uh, very important for historical or religious or political reasons. Um, and of course, Jerusalem came to be one of those cities. That also means that consuls were given a direct and, and a stronger power than all of the other consuls uh, around the Ottoman territory. They didn't have to go through their ambassadors, but they had a direct line uh, with their own uh, capital cities. I mean, the case that we'll talk about later, of course, it means that the uh, Italian consul had a direct line to Rome, skipping Istanbul. Now, paramount among the European powers, which developed interest in Jerusalem from the 19th century, uh, were Britain, Germany, France, and Russia. Uh, Britain was looking after its strategic, economic, and political interest in the Eastern Mediterranean, while Germany was trying to establish itself uh, on the Ottoman scene as an emerging nation. Uh, now, from the 1840s, the Prussian state, and subsequently uh, Germany, supported the Ottoman Empire and favored the settlement of its citizens, both Jews and Christians, in the region. France, through its, soul, uh, through its role as a traditional protector of the Catholics in the Holy Land, was looking to maintain influence in the region and among the local population. Meanwhile, the Russian government continued its protection of the Orthodox Church, tried to weaken the Ottoman Empire further after the Crimean War of 1856. Now, at the turn of the 20th century, the United States was not interested in uh, politics or strategic position, uh, and the American consulate mainly promoted American economic interest and assisted American travelers, pilgrims, and scholars. And as I said earlier, after the unification of Italy in the 1860s, the Italians expanded their interest in Palestine, and Jerusalem in particular, where they competed with the French government for the right to protection of the Catholics. Spain also opened a consulate in 1854 with the intention of catering for the different Catholic institutions of the city, and obviously to compete with France and Italy for the protection of the Catholics. In other words, what we have in Jerusalem is, is a competition between foreign powers who use their consular powers uh, as a proxy. You know, they, they fought a, a, a political war between themselves, using Jerusalem as a seat for that sort of battle. Now, as a representative of the government, consuls had to deal with both the Ottoman authorities and the local population. Their most important relationship was with the Mutasarif, or Jerusalem, the, the governor. Uh, given the frequent rotation of Ottoman officials, the consuls were always careful and, through their, uh, and thorough in their assessment of the officials appointed to the governorship of the Sanjak, the, the province of Jerusalem. So the main activity of a, of a governor in dealing with the consuls was attempting to circumvent the capitulations through the enforcement of measures restricting the, free, uh, the freedom of movement of foreigners or imposing special taxes on foreign businesses. Well, usually the consuls had the upper hand in uh, updating their capitulary rights. And only in a few occasions did the governors win the legal cases against the foreign consuls. This very good example from 1905 where the governor of Jerusalem, Rashid Bey, amid great dissent from the consuls, managed to impose on foreign residents outside the walls 
a tax on street lightening and sanitation proposed by the municipality. Um, the municipality, uh, and of course, Philistine later is going to talk about the role of the municipality, uh, was very strong in trying to um, sort of establish its own rights against the consuls. But as I said earlier, most of the time the consul had their upper hand. But in a few cases, managed to impose their own authority. And you know, 1905 is a good one. Now, one particular issue which caused friction between the parties was Jewish immigration to Palestine. The Ottomans attempted to counteract Jewish immigration with strict laws prohibiting movement and limits to land and house purchases by Jews. In October 1913, the local Ottoman authorities in Palestine were ordered by Istanbul to stop the system of issuing red papers, which granted Jews entering Palestine permission to visit for a limited period, as long as they surrender passports. Now, uh, this was a measure uh, that was meant to somehow control, uh, you know, Jews entering Palestine as tourists and then to become uh, residents. Uh, you know, you, you can parallel this to somehow uh, Trump policies on um, uh, visas in America. You know, the idea is like to stop immigration somehow. somehow. Uh, but despite instructions from the authorities, uh, Ottoman governors often had to succumb to consular pressures. And then, you know, this is the moment where consuls intervene and uh, use this uh, protégé system. Uh, and so they made this foreign subjects their protégé. Therefore, they, again, somehow uh, gained the right uh, to remain in the Ottoman Empire, whether in Jerusalem or other parts uh, of the empire itself. Now, consuls were, in general, highly critical of the Ottoman administration and dismissive of the local government, as reflected by a, a statement from the Italian consul in 1896, quote, it is general opinion that the Ottomans will not obtain any efficient result from the reforms, the Tanzimat reforms, uh, the new administrative system will upset the population. Likely, the reforms will be delayed. Uh, now, obviously, the, the Italian consul was partly right, but also partly wrong. The, 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 the Tanzimat reforms had a major impact over the Ottoman Empire, but also were not necessarily uh, fully uh, effective. Now, although consuls were critical in the end, they had to accept the final decisions of the Ottoman rulers. While this, stem, this stemmed from some genuine respect for Ottoman authority, it is also quite apparent that it was easier for consuls to blame local authorities when things were turning negative. Consuls also directed relations between the local authorities and the European firms that managed the city's public services. There was a great competition among the consulates to win concessions from the Ottoman administration. So, for instance, early 1914, a large project was finally granted to the French Parisian bank Perrier to construct a tramway line, fit pipes to bring portable water to the city, and expand and electrify streets lighting. Now, after fierce competition between a number of European companies, this eventually was granted to, a friend, to the French one. Uh, however, obviously, the project was halted uh, because of the outbreak of World War I. Now, in this agreement, the municipality of Jerusalem would have acquired control uh, of both services and infrastructure after a period of 10 or 15 years. So the municipality was thus trapped in a vicious cycle of dependency created by the capitulary system, which, through political means, had greatly favored the penetration of current capital. So and essentially, again, the municipality, once again, uh, was the recipient of a foreign amount of investment, but of course that meant the municipality was not able to uh, be fully independent vis-a-vis -vis this foreign uh, investment. In 1906, the governor of Jerusalem, Ali Ekrembey, wrote to Istanbul arguing that in a country where more than half of the population was foreign, it was impossible in questions relating to the municipality to treat foreigners as though they did not exist. And I think this is a very important criticism where Ali Ekrembe recognized that uh, foreigners were an important component of, of Jerusalem and, and you know, the region, and so they had to deal as they existed, not just on paper, but also as real individuals. Now, it is difficult to assess the relationship between consuls and the local populations. Consuls often dealt with local entrepreneurs and members of the notable families, but occasionally they also dealt with ordinary citizens. Unfortunately, 
sources available cannot be considered particularly reliable in shedding light on this area. In fact, in official correspondence, this relationship was rarely discussed unless related to consular activities. Indeed, some consuls might have chosen to be completely isolated from the local scene. They could not, however, chose to remain apart from Jerusalem and its environmental problems, such as lack of water or periodic epidemics. Consuls were residents, whether they liked it or not. Now, I'm asking to move to um, the second slice, and then rapidly to the uh, third and fourth. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, because it's, you know, I can't see it uh, from here. Uh, but basically, in uh, what I wanted to show, now, if you can go back to uh, the second slice, slide, sorry. Uh, basically, this is, as, you know, two maps, uh, one from the pre, uh, so the late Ottoman era, and one from the British time, uh, showing the positions of the consulate. So, as you can see, uh, if you move to uh, the slide number three, by the end of Ottoman rule, the majority of the consulates were in the old city. You can see circled in red. Um, and then if you move to slide number four, you can see that by the uh, uh, time of the British mandate, the consulate moved outside the walls, uh, which also is a reflection of the expansion of the city and also the changing nature of uh, sort of the, uh, the relevance uh, of the city, of the old city, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the new city, so sort of the expansion outside the walls. And, and again, I'll be very happy then to answer a question about this. Uh, yeah, we can move now to uh, slide number five, which is related to the uh, second part of the paper about the Italian consulate. So briefly, um, an Italian presence uh, has been visible for centuries in Jerusalem in the form of clergy and pilgrims, obviously. However, the size of this community did not match its political relevance, which was overshadowed by British and French consulates and communities, echoing the relatively unimportance of Italy on the international stage. Uh, there are only a few works dedicated to Italian diplomacy. Uh, an Italian scholar, Lucia Rostagno, was right to suggest that we should bear in mind that from Italy, Palestine was far away and not included in the colonial dreams of the new Italian state, and certainly not as a destination for Italian migrants, who normally preferred moving to Alexandria or Egypt uh, nearby. At the end of the 19th century, Italian interests toward Palestine were mainly devotional, Italy had no connection whatsoever with the local Eastern Catholic churches, the Melkites, a field left, off the, uh, sorry, left open to the French. The Italian government uh, saw indigenous Catholics as a catalyzer to promote and defend the Italian cat, uh, character of the Latin patriarchy and the custody of the Holy Land. Uh, just to mention that both the patriarch and the Costos were in fact Italian subjects. The Salesian uh, had a substan substantial impact in Palestine, working with the local inhabitants. Similarly, the Franciscan, by far the largest Catholic group in Palestine, provided jobs and services to local Christians, but also Muslim and Jews alike. Politicians and diplomats were still far away. So we can see that the Italian sort of diplomacy at the very beginning of the late 19th century was not made of consuls, but of uh, other individuals, and mainly uh, religious figures. Now, in 1843, Consul Le Chantin from the Kingdom of Piedmont and Sardinia was sent to Jerusalem to protect the interests of its subjects and to challenge the French protectorate over Catholics. The second Sardinian Piedmontese consul, Adolfo Castellinar, as you can see, they're all French by, by descent, again, because uh, essentially a number of land uh, that nowadays are part of a French state used to be part of a Sardinian uh, kingdom. Uh, he left Jerusalem in, 19, in 1849, and the seat remained vacant and was filled again only a decade after the Italian unification uh, was completed. Now, the newly created Kingdom of Italy could not afford a wide and sophisticated diplomatic network. However, members of the Italian parliament were fully convinced of the necessity of opening a consulate in the Holy City. So eventually an agreement was made, and Vice-Consul Alessandro de Regge di Donato was appointed consul in Jerusalem on November 15, 1871. So, like his seven successors until the outbreak of World War I, Di Donato had no deep knowledge of the region or its languages, religions, and peoples. It was only 1911, with the impending Italian invasion of Libya, that the Italian Orientalist, Leone Caetani, uh, who eventually was one of the founders of the, um, the Orientales, so the uh, university Oriental University in Naples, 
that passionately petitioned the Italian parliament and foreign ministry to support the Oriental Institute in Naples as a place to forge young diplomats serving in the East. So uh, we can switch to uh, the next slide. Um, and I want to make a distinction here. I'm going to talk about, you know, a few minutes about uh, sort of the, uh, the Italian consular activities in the pre-fascist era and then later on during the fascist era because there are connections, but there are also major differences. So a major change occurred with the appointment of Carlo Senni in May 1907. Though not an Orientalist, the young consul was a careful observer and his reports gathered increasing amounts of information about the local communities in their intra and interrelations. Senni reported on in indigenous religious communities at length, offering suggestions on how to engage with them. Some of his comments may look naive or poorly informed, as he did not possess the knowledge of local politics. However, the fact that he was not involved in any major local disputes or in any major scheme to control one or more groups provide a perspective that can contribute nuance uh, to what we know of local politics. And, and he also provides invaluable information about Jerusalem during World War I, as he remained in the city until the spring of 1915, reporting on a variety of subjects. The Seni left Jerusalem upon the Italian declaration of war against the Ottoman Empire. It is possible to say that he made the Italian presence in the region more relevant and at the same time brought Jerusalem and Palestine closer to Italy and Italians. With the end of the war, Seni returned to Jerusalem for a short period of time, but everything had changed. Now the British were in control uh, and the Italian government was involved in re redrawing the Middle East. Despite the increased role of Italian diplomacy in Palestine, both the British and the French marginalized Italy, which they saw more as a nuisance than a challenge. Italian diplomacy, meanwhile, was unable to react quickly to the changes occurring in Palestine. Between 1919 and 1926, seven different consuls led the Italian consulate. Copies of the reports sent to Rome show the lack of a diplomatic initiative and a general superficial understanding of the events unfolding in Palestine and Jerusalem including the emerging national struggle between Arabs and Zionists. Now, this diplomatic weakness was a reflection of Italian politics, as the fascist regime was slowly taking over. It is in 1926, with the appointment of Mario Zanotti Bianchi, that the Italian diplomatic efforts became more substantial and visible. Now, we move to uh, the, um, the next slide, which really covers the, the fascist period. Uh, Jerusalem and Palestine came to play a more important role for Italian diplomacy and politics, uh, obviously during the fascist period, as Mussolini aimed at extending Italian influence over the Mediterranean as part of um, his dream to make Italy an empire. Palestine became a battleground against British influence in the region. One of the most interesting consuls yet to be fully analyzed is Orazio Pedrazzi, Appointed in 1927, Pedrazzi was not a diplomat by profession, but a journalist and an expert, so-called an expert, on Middle Eastern politics. Likely he had a direct line with Mussolini, and in his short tenure, he emphasized the necessity to work with the Zionists as they were going to dictate the future of Palestine. Bear in mind that uh, Pedrazzi, like many of his contemporaries, he was an anti-Semite, but he understood the value of uh, establishing a strong connection with the Palestine, in particular, with the uh, um, sort of a branch of Zionists that sort of detached uh, from the mainstream Zionist movement of, you know, Jabotinsky and sort of the um, sort of extreme wing, uh, which in a sense uh, essentially were fascist too in some in some way. Uh, though he was an anti-Zionist and uh, Arabophobe, his main concern was to challenge British rule, and thus he lost his job rather quickly. For, you know, for the reasons that the British pushed Mussolini to remove him. Uh, but as I said, his activities were fairly um, important in the sense that they led uh, Italian diplomacy uh, later through, uh, you know, through the 1920s and 30s. So after Pedrazzi left on the eve of the Wailing War riots in 1929, Mussolini changed direction and his support for the Arab-Palestinian cause became more visible in terms of propaganda and help lend to local Palestine, uh, Palestinian elites. It would be interesting to discover in the papers of the consulate, which I'm actually, it's a work that I'm doing right now, uh, the extent and quality of Italian-Zionist relations, which certainly did not altogether cease uh, 
what we see is also this parallel activities of Italians uh, materially supported the uh, uh, Palestinians, particularly later on through the 1930s, but at the same time keeping open channels with the Zionist movement. Uh, again, not necessarily with the uh, uh, mainstream movement, but certainly with the Jabotinsky uh, side of the movement. So mm, let me move to a the next slide, uh, again, which is a sort of a representation of uh, the, the, the support for the, um, you know, for the Zionist movement, where you can see here uh, you should have a picture, I can't see it from here, uh, of um, a pavilion open uh, uh, in, in Tel Aviv, sort of the, uh, you know, during the uh, uh, Levant uh, fair. Uh, but more importantly, is also the fact that uh, the, the, the Italian government, um, through the Italian consulate in Jerusalem, sponsored the opening of a somehow a club uh, dedicated to spread Italian uh, culture. And again, this was a part of the uh, effort to spread Italian propaganda uh, through a circle opened by the Zionists in Tel Aviv. Uh, now, the men who helped to bring some local Arabs Roberto? to the Italian side... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting close. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, ...was uh, De Angelis, who served until 1936. Um, now, at the same time, De Angelis, while providing a lot of money to the Arabs also, again, re-established a strong relationship with Jabotinsky. Uh, now, Mussolini never met Jabotinsky. This is important to remind. Uh, but it would be interesting to discover more about their relationship. Many works have dealt with the emergence of the alliance between Mussolini and the Mufti of Jerusalem, Al uh, Amin al -Usaini. And it is clear that Mussolini had to adopt different policies um, in Libya and show a stronger commitment towards the Arabs and Muslims in order to sort of keep uh, you know, the peace uh, in Libya, so that he could gain uh, uh, friendship uh, and transform anti-Italian sentiments to pro-Italian sentiments. And to this extent, in, this, in the last slide, you can see uh, the images of Radio Bari. Uh, Radio Bari was established in order to support Italian propaganda uh, in the region. It became very popular in Jerusalem, particularly through the years of the revolt between 1936 and 1939. Now, uh, obviously, in 1939, uh, the consulate closed with the outbreak of World War II between Italy and Great Britain, and the years of the revolt mark the strong Italian support for the Palestinian uh, cause, but at the same time show that Italian propaganda was ultimately unsuccessful in turning the Palestinians against the British. One last point, since later on you're going to talk about 1948, the Italian consulate in 1948 uh, moved within the walls once again into the, uh, uh, literally, physically, the rooms of the custody of the Holy Land uh, for at least a year. Uh, after that, of course, we have a re-establishment of an Italian consulate in what then became West Jerusalem, and again, a consulate in East Jerusalem. Uh, what is interesting, contemporary, is that the consulate in West Jerusalem still represent sort of the interest of Italian in Palestine, where the interests of Italian in Israel are represented in the consulate in Tel Aviv. So marking, obviously, two major uh, different political uh, sort of approaches to, uh, to the region and the city itself. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto, for this uh, sweep sweeping account of uh, consular presence in Jerusalem of uh, Italian presence in, in particular. Now we move on to uh, Father Stan Naili, who is a researcher at the Institut Francais du proche orient in Amman. She specializes in the uh, social history of late Ottoman and Mandate Palestine and Jordan, but uh, she's not shy uh, of touching on present time uh, issues through her interest in collective memory and oral history. She also works on the politics of uh, heritage and folklore. I hand it over to you. Thank you Thanks. very much. Um, good morning. I would like to first of all thank the Middle East Institute and in particular Victor and Jamalia for inviting us and hosting us. And um, I would like to thank Michael for opening up so largely opening up these large horizons this morning, and Roberto for introducing uh, the municipality uh, in the course of his paper. I'm going to take you away from religious dimensions for a little while at least. 
And I will take you to something which is really different, which is the sphere of urban governance. So, as many of you may know, Jerusalem was one of the very first cities in the Ottoman Empire to create a municipal council. Actually, from the 1880s onwards, the city council was composed of nine to 12 elected members. Now, of course, this was male-only censitary suffrage. Um, these members were elected for a four-year renewable term. And it was up to the imperial government to choose the mayor among the elect elected members. So just to give you an idea of where this, um, oh, this is the PowerPoint. Uh, this is one of the last pictures of the municipal council uh, on Jaffa Street. Um, so <clears throat> council members had to be Ottoman citizens. They could not be protégés of foreign consulates. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, this is just a, a little skip into the primary uh, documents, which actually form the basis of, uh, of my research. Uh, so you see up here what constitutes the municipal council minutes. So basically, um, Muslims constituted the majority on the council, but there were always also Christian and Jewish members. Now, this representation depended on population census data and on tax-paying criteria, not on confessional quotas. And I insist on that, and you will understand why later on. The establishment of the municipality occurred at a turning point in Jerusalem's history. Since the second half of the 19th century was rife with important changes on the administrative, political, and demographic levels. Okay. So in 1872-73, the sub-province of Jerusalem became independent of the province of Damascus. It became a mutasarrafiya and began to depend directly on Istanbul as an autonomous sub-province. The population doubled between 1800 and 1870 and reached almost 70,000 inhabitants in 1914, making Jerusalem the largest Palestinian city on the eve of the First World War. This population was divided equally between the old and the new city. At the turn of the century, municipal services such as street lighting, sweeping, and garbage collection were progressively extended to the city. So you, you see, I'm taking you to really grassroots issues, very far from what we generally talk about when we talk about Jerusalem. Um, now in 1895, the Municipal Council took offices on Jaffa Street, just opposite the old city, and that's the image I showed you in the beginning. The city, the city council had been uh, within the confines of the old city before that. And this move outside of the old city demonstrated the municipality's will to accommodate and manage the city's development and simultaneously placed it at the heart of what was becoming the new business district of the city. The municipality played an important role in the development of the new city center, which stretched westward from Jaffa Gate, Babel Khalil in Arabic, along Jaffa Street, where it established the municipal hospital and pharmacy, the municipal park, in addition to its own offices. It thus took an active part in urban planning by conferring a resolutely civic aspect to this new city center. The new heart of the, new, of the city was an extension of the commercial artery located inside the old city near Jaffa Gate, where, by the way, the municipality owned a lot of shops, which generated important income for the municipality. In its approach to urban planning, the municipality thus emphasized continuity between the old and the new city, while allowing the new neighborhoods to differ in their form from the old heart of Jerusalem. All of that was to change under British occupation and mandatory rule. So in the beginning of December 1917, 
when uh, General Allenby addressed the population of Jerusalem for the first time within the confines of the old city, he did not mention Jerusalem's civic institutions. He emphasized the upholding of the status quo in the religious sphere and in the holy places. And this speech was a very good indicator of what was to come in the sphere of urban governance. As you know, the Charter of the British Mandate affirmed in Articles 2, 6, and 11 the commitment of the British authorities to the creation of a Jewish home in Palestine and of the necessary conditions for Jewish immigration. Article 4 of the Charter called for the recognition of a Jewish agency whose role would be to advise and collaborate with the Mandate Administration in all matters linked to the establishment of a Jewish home in Palestine. The Zionist executive began to quickly fulfill this role and became the Jewish agency. While the British authorities would have liked to see a similar organization take shape among the Arabs, the executive committee of the Arab Congress of Palestine refused to become the counterpart of the Jewish agency, since that would imply recognition of the Mandate's charter and the Balfour Declaration. In 1921, the Mandate authorities established the Supreme Muslim Council to have it administer all Muslim religious affairs, including the Awqaf, the Pious Foundations, the funds for orphans and religious courts. This, count, this council, contrary to the Arab Congress, entailed also the de facto exclusion of Christian Arabs. The mandate authorities thus reinforced the community bodies which, while curtailing the power of the municipality, which was asked to provide public services, but no longer played any role in urban planning or even in collecting tax revenues. However, <clears throat> since the provision of services included water supply, of course, the municipality still was a locus of dispute. It, was a, it became a theater and also a stake in the conflict between Palestinian nationalists and the Zionist movement, which militated for a stronger representation of Jews at all levels of the institution. Now, the Municipal Corporations Ordinance of 1934 specified the composition of the Municipal Council as six Arabs and six Jews, according to the categorization of the population established by the mandate. The mayor had to be Muslim, one of the deputy mayors a Christian, and the other a Jew. So you see, this is a fundamental turn away from Ottoman policies. And actually, it's something that is not unique to British colonial rule, since we have the French mandate established something very similar in Beirut. <clears throat> so the creation of electoral districts during this period incorporated many new Jewish neighborhoods while excluding several Arab villages in a gerrymandering effort to manipulate election results. British mandate authorities intervened repeatedly in municipal affairs starting with a, with a dismissal of Mayor Musa, Musa Qasim al husseini for participating in an anti-Zionist demonstration during the Nabi Musa festival in 1920. In 1937, it was the city's mayor, Hussein Fakhri al-Khalidi, who had been elected in 1934, who was exiled for having played an active role in the Arab revolt, which had begun in 1936. Finally, in 1945, conflicts within the municipality became so paralyzing that the British High Commissioner decided to dissolve the Municipal Council and appoint a Municipal Commission to replace it. So long before the dissolution of the municipality, British authorities had already assigned its former roles in urban planning and in enforcement of building regulations to other institutions. And this is where I'm actually relying a lot on Roberto's work. Um, Military governor Robert Ronald Storrs and his advisor Charles Ashby took charge of these fields through the establishment of the Pro-Jerusalem Society as early as 1918. So I'm taking you back a little bit in the chronology again. The Pro-Jerusalem Society brought together the mayor of Jerusalem, foreign consuls, and religious representatives of the Christian de denominations with other representatives of the Arab, Jewish, and foreign communities in the city. So we're very far from a civic model. We're coming to a model 
with confessional representation and consular representation, which is very different from what we had before. Uh, the Town Planning Commission, established in 1920, took over from the pro-Jerusalem society. It was responsible for defining the city's boundaries, zoning, and arranging eight new neighborhoods in the new city. It also retained the right to review all building permit applications submitted to the municipality. According to the Town Planning Ordinance of 1921, it was the only body authorized to receive complaints about urban planning. Now, where does that leave the municipality? Well, <clears throat> when Ronald Storrs called for the development of a master plan for Jerusalem in the early 1920s, one of his explicit objectives was to preserve the appearance and atmosphere of Jerusalem. So the authors of the plan worked to preserve the old city and its appearance from the outside by establishing a green belt uh, around the walls of the city. This entailed the demolition of many houses and shops in this area. Following that same logic of preserving the old city as a non-changing historical monument, the clock tower on Jaffa Gate, which had been built in 1907, was knocked down despite protests from the municipality. Just show you an image of that. <clears throat> These drastic measures illustrate the logic of opposition between the old city and the new city that drove the British approach to urban planning. In parallel, the old city was now presented as a complex composed of four confessional districts, the Muslim, Christian, Jewish, and Armenian districts. Whereas the last Ottoman population census at the beginning of the 20th century had documented the existence of mixed districts, with most names devoid of any confessional connotation. Ultimately, these projects divided Jerusalem into a predominantly Jewish city in the West and an old Eastern city, mainly Arab. <clears throat> the services offered in the old city were mainly aimed at preserving its historical and architectural heritage character, while those offered to the new city were meant to create a modern city according to European criteria. This approach was the opposite of the policies of the Ottoman municipality, which had begun to provide lighting and cleaning services, first of all in the old city, before gradually meeting the growing needs created by the extramural extension. The spatial continuity between the old and the new city, particularly around Jaffa Gate, had corresponded to the demographic, social, and administrative continuity at the end of the Ottoman era. The municipality thus became a main locus of confessionalization as a social and spatial process. The municipality's loss of power between the end of the Ottoman era and the Mandate period was both a consequence of this process and a colonial tool whose aim it was to reduce the margins of political mobilization of the Arab population. We can therefore say that if the municipality experienced great continuity in form since its foundation, in substance, its power was eroded during the mandate period, particularly in the field of urban planning. The municipality's political marginalization was accompanied by the creation of competing institutions, the Pro-Jerusalem Society and the Town Planning Commission, in which representatives from the main religious group joined consuls and the regime of experts imposed by the mandatory authorities. The urban management of Jerusalem was thus largely entrusted to experts chosen by the mandatory governor and religious leaders in a dual movement of patrimonialization of the old city and confessionalization of its local authority. The erosion of the municipality's power during the mandate period thus gave free rein to the British administration's plans. In this sense, Jerusalem's demunicipalization seems to have been a deliberate choice to monopolize control of the city space in both the physical and the political sense. Thank you. And the, the confessionalization of the urban urban space in, in Jerusalem and I think it's it's one of the things that maybe we can uh, explore a little bit in the uh, in the Q and A, but 
in the interest of time, I will open the floor to all of you uh, for questions. Uh, maybe we'll take one or two at a time. Uh, please raise your hand and introduce yourself very quickly. Please, yes. Thank you. Uh, I saw Nassar, uh, speaker later on. Uh, is Roberto still with us? Yeah, I'm with you. Oh, hi, Roberto. I'm sorry we missed you in person. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll start with a question for uh, Palestine. Uh, from what you describe, uh, it seems like the Israeli Municipal Council kind of continued this, uh, the same process. So I wonder if you can reflect on that, if it's part of your research or, or knowledge in general. And I also wanted to perhaps remind you that in the Belfort Declaration, uh, there is a discussion of the national right of the Jewish people, and the uh, non-Jewish people are simply referred to as the non-Jewish people, not as the Palestinians or the Arabs, and they're uh, specifically mentioned as Christians and Jews. So to what extent do you think the confessional nature of the British mandate period municipal council is a reflection of that where the Jewish is intended to be national as opposed to the Christian and the uh, Muslim being uh, uh, confessional in, uh, in that sense. Uh, and I actually forgot my question for Roberto, so I'm sorry, my dear. <laughs> we can come back to it. Yeah. Maybe taking one more and then, uh, yes, yes, please. Thank you. My, my question, uh, I'm Silvio Ferrari from the University of Milan. Uh, my question is to Roberto. Um, I was interested in, in, in one of your slides. You mentioned uh, Weichmann. Weichmann writing that the cleavage existing between the Vatican and uh, Italy in Rome did not exist in uh, Jerusalem. And, uh, and this brought to my mind that in Europe, a little later at the beginning of the last century, uh, there was another cleavage between the Vatican and France. And that cleavage too did not reflect, uh, as far as I understand, in the colonial uh, um, French uh, countries. So uh, I wonder whether the, the colonial policy is a place where uh, um, European church and state conflicts are overcome uh, in the name of uh, the convergence of the uh, national and the uh, religious, uh, which means Christian uh, interests. And, and this is what I would like. I would like to know what you think about this. Thank you. Thank you, Assam, for these very thought-provoking questions, some of which actually have been in my head for uh, a long time, and uh, I'm very far from having any answers, but I'm very happy to discuss it. In terms of the question of um, the continuity um, between uh, the British Municipal Council or the Mandate Period Municipal Council and the Israeli Municipal Council of Jerusalem, I mean, there's some things that sort of uh, immediately come to mind that the whole issue of service provision, you know, as a way of marking what uh, territory sort of is meant to be forward-looking and full of progress and development and what territory is sort of meant to be the stagnant, you know, uh, place of uh, underdevelopment. I mean, this, you know, we're very close to other models of colonial cities. We think about Algiers, we think about other places where we have those dynamics going on. So I think in that, in that sense, of course, we can, we can talk about this. And this is, of course, also a means of division. It's a, it's a way of marking uh, a dividing line. <clears throat> um, the other issue, which is about this, this whole categorization which basically changed between the end of the Ottoman period and the Mandate period from, you know, um, we, we first of all had a confessional 
uh, millet organization of, of the Ottoman society, and then later on with the Ottoman nationality, we came to something like a civic consciousness. And the beginnings of um, civic involvement and people being considered, first of all, uh, citizens of the empire. Uh, and then after that, we, okay, passing through uh, the Young Turk um, period where things were in an upheaval, um, we then came to the British period where all of a sudden categorizations were completely different. And we had on the one side the Jews and on the other the non-Jews, people just who existed as the negation of what was the important category in some ways. Um, it's, I think it's, it's very complex also to, to analyze the Palestinian reaction to this um, on the political level. Um, we had the constitution of the Muslim Christian associations during that time. We had the Arab Congress, and at the same time we had this Supreme Muslim Council, which um, basically left out part of the population. So there's a lot more to be said about it, and I'll, I'll be looking forward to discussing it more. Thank you, Roberto. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up what Philistine mentioned, because as you mentioned at the beginning, I'm really working on the sort of urban planning of Jerusalem around that period of time. And I think confessionalization is literally what drove the British in redrawing the city. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of strange because the British were meant to be the secular sort of power and, uh, you know, the beacon of sort of a secular government, but the reality is that they based their governance on religion. And, and of course, Jerusalem is not unique. Um, I, I'm looking at few cases around the British Empire, and they did the same in India in particular, uh, but also the same is in Ireland, of course, and in other African colonies. So obviously, this is a driving principle that we always should consider when looking at how the British influence uh, urban governance around the world. Now, going back to the point on uh, uh, Weizmann, uh, obviously Weizmann was not the only one to notice that, uh, you know, in Italy there was a division between the uh, Italian state and the Vatican state, uh, which they, done, they didn't recognize each other until 1929 when Mussolini signed the, uh, the agreement uh, with the Vatican. But essentially abroad they worked together. And Jerusalem, uh, you know, is a very good case where, you, you know, you can find tons of documents uh, you know, in the, um, uh, in the archives in Rome of an Italian consulate in Jerusalem where essentially the, the, the you know, churches, uh, a representative of the churches and the consul work together in drawing policies, uh, you know, whether propaganda, whether, uh, you know, financial policies to support each other, particularly you know, the consulate supporting Christian institutions. Um, so obviously, you know, the sort of division between the two was neglected in favor of cooperations abroad. And this is reflected also in the fact that in a number of documents, uh, they talked about uh, the French example uh, openly, where they recognized that France was a secular country, but abroad, uh, France uh, you know, gave up the principle of laicite and cooperated with the church, so the Italians adopted the same principle. Thank you. Yes. Ah, good morning. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add regarding the French case, which we spoke about this afternoon, um, there is this famous formula for the attribute to the French politician of this time, Gambetta, which um, who said anti clericalism is not a product for expectation. And this is indeed what happened in Jerusalem, especially in Jerusalem at the time. I'm going to connect to the two countries that later at length explain indeed that uh, we had at this time and maybe also today one and only one France and being religious or the lay France it was um, all these people as you said now the battle were acting in French interests. Okay, uh, a comment now a question maybe? Yes, Victor. Thank you very much. A good question for Palestine. Um, 
just responding to, to, to what you were saying to Islam after the Babel Declaration, you mentioned the Muslim Christians, the establishment of these Muslim Christian associations. Can you say more about that? What were these, were these simply organically developed by the Palestinians in reaction to the Babel Declaration, or is there any suggestion British soldiers or the, the, the foreign involvement in, 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 in separating the community of Palestine? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, one more question. Sorry, I didn't notice. Thank you so much for your presentations, Roberto and uh, Palestinian. Um, I have a question maybe for uh, both of you. So you talked about urban planning, and it has been used by Israel as a, as a political and strategic tool uh, to conquer more land. And I'm going to talk about this in my presentation. So I was just wondering if you could give me not some historical continuity as the in the sense that urban planning is also used by the British mandate to privilege the interests of uh, Israeli Jews um, and the, its Zionist partner uh, compared with the, um, Palestinians. So can you talk maybe more about this? Okay. Again, we'll start with you and then Robert. I should start? Okay. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask maybe Assam to jump in also. But uh, as it comes to, when it comes to the Muslim Christian associations, um, it seems to have been like a, a rather organic response and rather a decentralized response of um, some segments of the Palestinian populations and particularly of the Palestinian elite in the cities. Um, now. Of there are some theories that say that you know there there was maybe some encouragement from here or from there. I'm, frankly, I'm not in a position where I could um, say anything about that. I know that Jonathan Peratt uh, wrote uh, rather prolifically about this in the 70s already. Um, but uh, it's a very it's a very interesting movement to consider this whole movement of the Muslim Christian associations and the Arab congresses that were held, and it's something that has been um, disregarded, I think, for a long time because it didn't immediately. Uh, I mean, there were no concrete results other than a few uh, delegations uh, going to London, and, and it hasn't reserved, It hasn't really. <clears throat> Solicit, yeah, yeah, and he gotten the same of uh, the, the amount of attention that it should that it should get, and um, it's very complex to think about um, the way uh, people try to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the Zionist movement and vis-a-vis -vis of the mandate. It was uh, very difficult, I think, for people to know uh, which strategy to adopt: uh, outright refusal, no contact. Uh, or um, some sort of negotiation to try and uh, gain some sort of influence also, especially in the uh, first uh, few years of the mandate when things still seemed maybe a little bit more open to discussion. Um, I don't know if that helps, but maybe, maybe Assam wants to jump in. Well, I think the... Uh beginning of the Fr uh, British mandate or British occupation first was a period of, it, it comes after a long period of political activism within the Ottoman Empire in the Bilad al-Sham or the larger Syrian context where uh, Arabization largely in connection with the Syrian context, not, not the pan-Arabism of the Ba'ath Party later on, was, was the main tool of organization. Now, after the, the uh, fall of the Ottoman Empire, or at least the fall of Palestine outside of the Ottoman Empire, uh, I think there was a question of identity. It's not very clear yet, but if we look at the period from 1919 to 1922, more or less, we find that the various attempts at organizing in Palestine uh, first started with uh, Muslim and Christian associations, then the first Arab Congress in 1919, which defined Palestine as southern Syria. And uh, in fact, uh, warned against considering Palestinian identity as a separate identity from the Syrian identity, and that was considered a Zionist plot in some sense, uh, to later on after 1922 to move into the Arab executive and later on the uh, various other organizations, the high, higher 
Arab command and, and what have you, or committee. Uh, so in a sense, I think it, it was part of that confusion of how do you, uh, you've been singled out, and what kind of national identity are you gonna adopt? And I think the Christian Muslim very likely was an element of sort of continuity from the Ottoman frame of mind or from the Millat system. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not certain about that. If I can just jump in quickly. Uh, when, when I wrote about uh, the, the Nibi Musa riots, and of course the Muslim Christian associations were part of uh, you know, the events that took place in 1920, um, what was interesting, uh, I remember reading a lot of documents about the Christians try to uh, sort of uh, uh, cut uh, their role and their position uh, within obviously the, the emerging national movement. So the Muslim Christian associations also became a, an arena for Christians to uh, present themselves and essentially, you know, saying we're here and we're part of the movement, not because we're Christians, but because we are Arabs, Palestinians together. So I think it's a very interesting uh, um, uh, movement that emerged uh, at the beginning of, you know, sort of the British rule in that period of time. Please. Okay, uh, I agree with you that uh, the Muslim Christian associations were the continuation of the Ottoman period, but not the Millet system. Uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century, local identity as Palestine and al Quds emerged uh, there. Uh, and therefore, the Christian Muslim Association was an expression of a local identity, of Palestinian identity, rather than millet or religiously based identity. Uh, this is, uh, I, I discuss this in length in my live, uh, uh, Life in Common. I show that it was based, the, uh, the new identities was rooted in the, the society. So the Millet, Millet system actually on the ground collapsed. Um, you wanted to respond to an earlier question, right? Yes. Um, so Noor, you were asking about um, the issue of uh, urban planning. And basically, this is um, one of the points I'm trying to make in this paper, that if you remove the um, power on urban planning uh, of you know, among the prerogatives of a municipality, you basically take away the most important power that the municipality has because you take away its power over the space. And this is what is so, th this is what makes this municipal, this municipal council during mandate times almost a farce because how, how can you uh, consider yourself a municipal council if you do not receive building permit applications and you do not, uh, uphold public space, etc. Th these are this is the essence of what a municipality is supposed to be able to do in order to have some sort of power. Uh, I want to add something about because this is a very important question about the issue of continuity. Um, I think there's a complex answer to that, particularly when it comes to Jerusalem. Um, of course, there are continuities. I mean, we can observe that. But also, there are like there is a period between 1948 and 1967, which is, is different in a sense because obviously the city was not uh, was divided, uh, and I think a reflection of a continuity is in the archives. Um, if you ever worked in the municipal archives in Jerusalem, uh, which is a mess, uh, what is interesting is that essentially the Israeli are neglecting whatever is pre 1967. It did exist, Jerusalem, but in a different way. And, and I think, again, that, that's a continuity of like neglect of the British where only, you know, looked at certain aspects of development, which, you know, as in the question, obviously the British favor one side over the other. And, and, and you get to see the neglect, uh, you know, the British towards, you know, some Arab neighborhoods uh, in favor of, you know, the development of areas that eventually became uh, predominantly Jewish, and of course, uh, you know, sort of a Zionist in a sense. Um, 
you know, when, when you look at the maps that the British produced for the mandate and you can see all the emergence of the spots, you also see the, the clear plans of uh, literally segregating the city uh, and essentially dismantling all of the possibility of communication. And again, that's a ref sort of a continuity that you can see in, in Jerusalem 21st century. So it's, it's not just an issue of continuity, you know, looking in a timeline, but I think there's a many, many components that are suggesting how this continuity uh, sort of move forward in time. Thank you, Roberto. Yes, please. Hi, can I... Um, Works. Can I, is it clear? All right. Uh, it's a question mainly to Palestine, but Robert uh, may also have a, a comment on it. I completely agree with your emphasis on the way in which the British exploited confessionalism in order to uh, promote its uh, mandate policies. But I just wonder, is there a danger that you may, in emphasizing that, um, imply that somehow the Ottoman system was more benign when in, in itself the Ottoman system may have been responding to other pressures uh, and it is obvious, clearly, it is a, an imperial system, it's an empire. So what was going on in the Ottoman period, which it was also trying to control or trying to advance? So I just wonder if it's a sense that we look at the Ottoman period as a kind of um, golden age of Ottoman admini of administration when there were other agendas occurring at the time. And it would be interesting to hear what those were. Thank you. Um, of course, the Ottoman system was not more benign. It also it was also a power structure, and the administrative reforms during um, the late Ottoman period were meant to uh, strengthen the whole the hold that the Ottomans had on the Arab provinces. Um, this is clear, and um, the municipal council also was, of course, far from being uh, a truly democratic. Institution. I mean, as I said, it was based on male sensitivity suffrage. I mean, uh, estimations are that maybe 3% of the population of Jerusalem actually got to vote uh, in municipal council elections. So we're very far from a representative uh, democracy. But the whole point that I'm trying to make is that there was a system which could have been expanded there was, let's say, a democratic potential, even if it wasn't uh, completely exploited for various reasons, but it was there because that structure was there ready to be expanded, but I mean, it collapsed before that was really uh, able to happen. Any comments, Roberto? Maybe from the uh, yeah, perspective yeah, of consulars, I mean, short-circuiting Istanbul? Yeah. Uh, the, um, I mean, the Ottoman system was not benign, uh, but if I can add something, uh, in some, some way, in somehow, um, the Ottoman system allowed for the mixing of the population at an urban level. You know, obviously, you know, there are all of the religious regulations that prevented for, you know, people to either, you know, intermarry and so forth, but in terms of the urban structure, people were mixed. Whereas under the British, what we see is the mixing of the population, and this is their words. Uh, literally, they didn't understand how people of different religions could coexist on the same road, the same street, in the same building. Uh, and obviously that's a major, you know, sort of a departure from what was being created by the Ottomans uh, with the municipality. Questions? Okay, I had my uh, own, so finally I can ask them. Um, I, my question is to you, Roberto. Um, to to us, it's uh, it's very uh, it's given the importance of Jerusalem is given uh, locally, internationally, uh, otherwise. But uh, it's not it's not so clear to me why um, there would be such a strong consular representation as early as uh, the beginning of uh, the 19th century in a place where there was no. Um, uh, say, uh, big commercial activity. So we are talking about, you know, 19, 1843, 1850s, etc. Usually what you get is, um, so w when I compare, you know, other consular representatives around the, uh, representations around the world, 
what strikes me is that you have this uh, commercial center uh, of a big country, right? Canton in China, Tabriz in Iran, Alexandria in Egypt. Then there's all the incentive uh, for a country to open a, a, a consular representation. Jerusalem strikes me as a, a bit of an oddity in, in this picture, but uh, enlighten me if there are um, other examples. Is it that there is uh, a you know, uh, con there's, is it, the, for example, the prevalence of uh, Hajj routes that um, became, uh, became salient in the, in the, towards the middle of the 19th century and uh, further, especially in the late 19th century, uh, that brought more people into Jerusalem, maybe uh, more Muslims even, uh, on the way or on the way back uh, from Mecca? that created some sort of pilgrimage economy? Uh, was it the, the main point, uh, a, a geopolitical move uh, against Istanbul, given the fact that you emphasize the, cons the consuls sort of short-circuited the, um, you know, the embassy in Istanbul and reported directly back to uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in their home countries? Can you say a little bit uh, on this? Uh, thank you for your question, which is a great question. Uh, there are a number of works written, uh, and I try to write too about uh, why, you know, all of these European consulates opened in Jerusalem. The reality is that there's no real a fixed answer. I mean, one side of that is that uh, I think it spiraled into a competition. The British open a consulate, the Germans open a consulate, and then uh, essentially, Jerusalem, as I mentioned later, became a battleground for European uh, diplomacy to compete with each other. But you're right, there's no real interest other than the protection of some holy places, but there's no real trade uh, other than local trade. It's, Jerusalem is not on the route of major, uh, you know, sort of economic activities. That would have been Jaffa, later on certainly Haifa under the British. Um, so uh, it's, a not, it's not an obvious place to start a consular competition, but they did. Uh, and I think this reflects also sort of the, uh, you know, the idea of expanding um, European influence within the Ottoman Empire, but in general to project power abroad. Once the British open a consulate, then of course the French had to do it. They can't simply sit down and do nothing, right? Um, so I think that this is sort of a reaction uh, to, to you know, the first ones that they open. Um, I mean, in general, if you look at what they did, the British opened a consulate. They sent someone there. But other than caring for, you know, British pilgrims, uh, mainly scholars, the same with the, with the Americans, there's not really much of consular activity uh, to do. There's no real protection of uh, major interests. They, they created their own interest. I feel like a, 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 you know, a psychotherapist now saying that we created their own, our own problems and the consuls did exactly the same. They created their own uh, necessities. Uh, they allowed for the establishment of our activities for which then they had to grant protection. So it's a very interesting self-serving uh, uh, sort of uh, activity. They opened and then they created the conditions for which they could exist and thrive. Uh, but you're absolutely spot on in saying that, you know, Jerusalem was not an obvious place. For us now, it seems to be obvious, but it wasn't. Thank you. Uh, if I may comment and Please. add to what Roberto had to say, I think it's important to look at 19th century conflict between the European uh, colonial powers at the time, and um, in particular the uh, Crimean War, mm. which ended in 1856 yeah. with an agreement uh, that basically placed different religious communities under the protection of different countries, different powers. And uh, if the French are to be the protectors of the Catholics and the British are the protectors of the Jews and the Sultan is the protector of the Muslims uh, and the Russians are the protectors of the uh, Orthodox Christians, uh, in a sense, Jerusalem becomes very important symbolically. Mm -hmm. Not to mention that, uh, of course, the Crimean War was not about Jerusalem or Bethlehem, but the spark for the conflict came from a conflict in the church in Bethlehem between the various 
denominations. And that was one of the issues that were on the mind of the negotiators in 1856. So I think in some sense, um, you know, it cannot be, uh, if, if it is the city of the various religious groups and through which the consulates can, uh, I mean, they were not consulates in the sense of diplo diplomacy as we understand it today. They were more like they saw themselves as leaders of certain communities, as protectors of certain communities within the city. So they were competitors to the city council that came later on and to the various other organizations, at least that's how I think. Good reminder, actually, um, because Jerusalem is obviously the, not the only place where you have uh, Jews, Christians, and uh, Arabs, Turks uh, live together. It, other places like Smyrna, Trabizon, and so on would be obvious places where uh, to open. So in that way, what you're suggesting is actually this is not the typical consular uh, representation that you think of. It's, it's a different sort of body. Uh, uh, sort of an international patronage of uh, local leadership in competition with uh, uh, others. Yes, please. Just to, to complete, and I fully agree with you regarding the symbol. We are in Jerusalem, and it's very symbolic important, it's symbolically important to be there, and especially also for France and for, for French people. It was uh, also quite interesting to, at this time, at the middle of the 19th century, to create or to recreate a kind of ideal France, because after all the turmoils of the revolution, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, it was possible to create or to have in Jerusalem this community, this um, solidarity, and this is what I mentioned also earlier, this unicity between politics and religion. And this was not achieved in France, or this has been destroyed ideally uh, in, in France, and this had to be recreated in, in Jerusalem in, in, in a way. And uh, we talk at the time of France du Levant, and uh, the France du Levant was incarnate, incarnated by this combination of politics and religion in, in Jerusalem. So, yeah, the question of symbol is very uh, pregnant, very, very, very important at, this at the time. Just, just to pick up um, something that Sir Roberto um, mentioned about the lack of um, concrete interest that the imperial powers had in, in Jerusalem, apart from what uh, Islam was saying, the symbolic nature of, of it. I, I'm speculating here, I'm not a, a, an expert of this period at all, but I'm just speculating the role of espionage in the late Ottoman Empire, where many of the imperial powers are very conscious that the empire is weak and maybe fragmenting, and Jerusalem is a good cover for this kind of espionage to take place. Uh, you can be a pilgrimage, and you can also take sketches and make observations and write diaries and reports, so that's, that's one thing. And the second thing, the role of India in the um, uh, way in which the imperial powers were reconfiguring that influence in, uh, overseas. 1857 was the big revolt in India. Muslims and Hindus were revolting. What goes on in Jerusalem may have occurred to them would be important to understand how to deal with the, 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 the impact of the revolt in India and therefore on uh, Indian imperial possessions elsewhere. And these are just the thoughts. Uh, I'm guessing I don't have a deep knowledge of that, but I just wonder if you would consider that as, a, as possible reasons. Any responses? Roberto? Yeah, actually, this is a very good point. Certainly for the British. I mean, the British were the first ones to, uh, you know, through the Palestine Exploration Funds and for other enterprises to sort of rely on diplomacy and informal diplomacy through the work of scholars to essentially map the terrain, uh, get a sense of the resources in the area, you know, just in case. Uh, so I think the role of, uh, of espionage in some way is very important, perhaps not for everyone, as I said, certainly not for the Italians, uh, but I, I, I suspect that for, for the French, for the Germans, you know, obviously the British, uh, it, it was part of the job. It was, uh, you know, sort of exploring the land, 
uh, get to know sort of uh, the resources. And again, that shows that the area was, uh, you know, used for their, their projection of power. Uh, in other words, you know, they used Palestine and Jerusalem uh, as a proxy for their own political gains, not necessarily in Jerusalem and in Palestine, but, you know, largely in the Ottoman Empire or in Europe. If I, if I may add to that, um, Roberto talked about the Palestine Exploration Fund, and actually they were the ones who commissioned the first ordnance surveys of mm -hmm. Palestine in the second half of the eight, 19th century. And these ordnance surveys ended up um, actually serving the British Army during the First World War. So the connection is an important one, and, uh, and scholars, or more so Orientalists during that period, um, did have a certain role to play. Uh, another quick question to both of you, since we have time. Um, was there a, a visible increase in the number of pilgrims coming to Jerusalem? from all uh, denominations around the time that we uh, speak of. So this is the late 19th century, maybe early 20th century. And the question is, if that is probably the case, what uh, sort of an, uh, uh, it overlaps obviously with uh, the symbolic patronage of European powers uh, within the Ottoman realm, but also maybe has some sort of impact on the uh, urban landscape. So when it comes to municipal services, uh, so you expect pilgrims to come and then leave, but was there a permanent uh, dimension that was emerging out of these uh, circulations? And not only uh, uh, Jewish, but also other denominations. Can I just mention uh, that uh, the next issue of the Jerusalem Quarterly will be dedicated to pilgrims. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important question, obviously. Um, of course, what we see in the late 19th century uh, is an increase of uh, pilgrims, but also tourists, who are, you know, different kind of pilgrims, uh, in a way. Uh, you know, traveling, obviously, through Jaffa, you know, through Palestine to visit Jerusalem uh, and, and all around the region, uh, which also meant they, you know, they needed more services. Um, what I found interesting is uh, sort of the... Uh, the the, I'm trying to find the right word, sort of the nationality of these pilgrims. Uh, many were Russians, and obviously, you know, the beginning of World War I meant, uh, you know, sort of a break of pilgrims visiting uh, Jerusalem. Many were poor Russians who eventually, you know, even desired to, uh, uh, to die over there. It's a, it's a sort of a hajj for themselves, you know, to, to visit the holy city. Um, but what, what I think is important is not only the number and the nationality of the pilgrims, but the fact that they had an impact, as you mentioned, over the urban structure. These individuals needed, uh, uh, you know, services. Now, the Russians built a full compound dedicated to the pilgrims. This already, obviously, in the uh, sort of a mid-late uh, 19th century, what is now known the, uh, the, the Russian compound. Uh, unfortunately, today is, you know, hosting a, a jail. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's really a remnant of this idea of increasing the pilgrimage uh, of Russian people to Jerusalem. But, you know, there's also different kind of pilgrims coming from different uh, parts of Europe. And, and, of course, they needed accommodations, which also means more hotels, more people employed in, the, in, 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 this, in this sector. So, obviously, the, the increase of pilgrims had a major impact over the urban structure, not just the physical, uh, you know, buildings, but also in the services and in the the fact that people were drawn from uh, the periphery of Jerusalem, moved into the cities in order to provide services to these visitors. Yeah, of course, Jerusalem has been shaped uh, in many ways also by the um, different types of pilgrimage. And um, Roberto mentioned the, the Russian pilgrimages, which were really important during the second half of the 19th century uh, in terms of numbers, particularly. But also, I mean, traditionally, if you look at um, the landscape of the old city of Jerusalem, you have the Maghrebi quarter, which actually uh, gradually grew throughout the 17th century as a result of pilgrimage from North Africa. And you also have uh, a very small African quarter, which in part was also constituted of Muslim pilgrims who ended up settling in uh, Jerusalem 
And then, of course, you have Jewish pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So it's a city which has been shaped importantly um, by pilgrimage and by this wish to complete that journey once or at least um, be buried in Jerusalem. Unless there are any urgent remarks, we have come to the end of this session. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a very fruitful discussion. I think we're moving on uh, to the next panel straight.